And just to be clear, here is where things stand in this country right now. More than 223,000 Americans are dead. 32 states tonight showing upward trends in new cases. Only one state in the entire country is on a downward swing. The daily case count in the United States topping 70,000. And we don't even have today's numbers, so I'll give you yesterday's. The count then was the fourth highest day of cases overall since the pandemic began. Today, we are already over 65,000, so we're on track for another near record. 12 states seeing their highest seven-day averages for new daily cases yesterday, and the seven-day average of deaths continues to climb. Now it's 763, which is the highest level of average weekly deaths in a month. Hospitalizations also on the rise. 41,010 Americans reported hospitalized with COVID on Thursday. Out front now, Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And Dr. Fauci, I, I appreciate your time. You know, we look at these numbers and they're sobering. And, you know, there's been this chart out there that has been deeply concerning comparing the U.S. to Europe. And, uh, you know, you know this well. I'll, I'll put it up for everyone to see. Europe, a couple weeks in, ahead of the U.S. at the beginning, right? We saw the surge and then there and then here. The numbers there came down then significantly, but that never really happened here, right? We always were at a much higher plateau. Now in Europe, a super spike in cases well ahead of what we're seeing here in the United States. Are you concerned that we could be about to follow suit with a massive spike? Yeah. Uh, Aaron, I am concerned about that. And the reason I'm concerned is the numbers that you gave, our baseline is really quite high. If we hang around around 50, 60, 70,000, and we're there. That's the reflection of community spread. And then as you look at the map of the country, you see more than 30 states are having upticks in test positivity, which is, is a pretty good predictor that you're gonna have a surge in cases which will lead to surge in hospitalizations. The reason I'm particularly concerned, as we get deeper into the cooler months of the fall and the colder months of the winter, that activities out of necessity are gonna to have to be done indoors. And that's gonna be a problem. So that's the reason why I say we really need to double down on the kind of public health measures that we've been talking about so long. And I don't mean shutting down the country, Aaron, because whenever I talk about amplifying and just stressing the public health measures, people think that that means we're gonna shut down. It doesn't mean that. It means there are some fundamental things that you can do universal mask wearing, keeping a distance, avoiding congregate and crowded sessions, sections, particularly indoors, and wash your hands as often as you possibly can. They sound, they sound very simple, but we're not uniformly doing that. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing these surges. We can control them without shutting down the country. And we've got to pay particular attention now, particularly these congregate settings indoor more than outdoor, that we will get, we will lose control over it if we don't do that. So that's the reason why I, as much as I can essentially plead with the American public to please take these things seriously. We can turn it around. There is a new study, Dr. Fauci, from Columbia University, and, and it had a big range, but, but a horrifying range, 130,000 to 210,000 Americans uh, would be alive if we had had a stronger response to the virus, right? Up to 94% of the people who have died in this country could still be alive. If we had done some of the things you just mentioned, um, national mask mandates, um, they also cite the insufficient testing response early on uh, and delayed overall response. Some of the reasons that they think these deaths could have been prevented. Um, like I said, it is a stunning study to read. Do you think that that many lives could have been saved by those simple but fundamental things? You know, Aaron, I, I don't want to put a number on it because, you know, that's a model study, but I feel quite confident that if we had uniformly done the things that I was talking about just a moment ago, that certainly considerable number of lives could have been saved. You know, remember back when we were having the daily press conferences at the White House, and I was saying when we were talking about opening up the economy and opening up the country again, we had the gateway, the phase one, the phase two, the phase three, and I emphasize that it's not gonna be an all or none phenomenon. It's not like turning a light switch on or off. 
It can't be that you can go from being relatively locked down to just opening up and just not worrying about anything. You've got to do it in a graded fashion. And a graded fashion means you, guide, you abide by the guidelines, but you do it with some fundamental common denominators. And that's what I refer those five things to. They're almost like minimal common denominators that we've got to do. And we've got to do it across the board. We can't be having some not doing it at all and others adhering to it. Otherwise, if, right, lives, lives likely could have been sh- uh, saved if we had done it that way. But it's not too late. I mean, that's the yeah. point I want to make. I don't, I don't like we throw up our hands and say, well, yeah. this was terrible. We can turn it around. We can. So... We can by doing those things. Um, we know what you're talking about, though, some of your concern about what we're seeing in Europe and whether that could happen here is obviously inconsistent with what the president is saying. I don't need to tell you that, but he did just speak moments ago at a rally. Uh, and here's what he said. We're going to quickly end this pandemic, this horrible plague that came in from China. You look at what's going on and we're rounding the turn. We're rounding the corner. We're rounding the corner beautifully. Dr. Fauci, do you agree? Well, if you look at the numbers, Aaron, it, it tells us that, that we, we really are facing a very challenging situation. And if we don't do something in the sense of paying stricter attention to the kinds of public health mitigation issues that we were talking about, it's not going to spontaneously turn around. So the good news on the horizon is that vaccines look promising. And hopefully by the time we get to the end of November, the beginning of December, we will have shown that we have at least one or two and maybe more, but at least two vaccines that are safe and effective. That's going to be an important issue. But from the public health standpoint, if you look at the numbers of the daily infections, the upticks on the map of more than 30 states that are having upticks, it's not going to spontaneously turn around unless we do something about it. We don't want to throw our hands up and give up. That's ridiculous to do that. But on the other hand, we don't want to just say that nothing can happen. We we can we have control of this. We can do things that could turn that around. So I I understand, uh, you know, you you, you don't want to wade into politics, but masks are not political. Right. They 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 shouldn't be political. Right. And, and, you know, we see the president, these rallies and people don't wear masks. And uh, Joe Biden does have a really different plan. Right. And today he talked about it and he specifically talked about making mask wearing mandatory. Here's how he put it. First, I'll go to every governor, urge them to mandate mask wearing in their states. And if they refuse. I'll go to the mayors and county executives and get local masking requirements in place nationwide. He also wants to make masks mandatory, federal buildings, interstate transportation. Um, Do you think this is a good idea? Is this what a president of the United States would be helpful if they were doing, fighting for mask mandates? Well, you know, one of the issues that people that talk about mandating not be a good idea because then they'll say they have to enforce it and there's going to be a difficulty enforcing it. But if everyone agrees that this is something that's important and they mandate it and everybody pulls together and say, you know, we're going to mandate it, but let's just do it. I think that would be a great idea to have everybody do it uniformly. One of the issues, though, you, I, I get the argument, say, well, if you mandate a mask, then you're going to have to enforce it and that'll create more of a problem. Well, if people are not wearing masks, then maybe we should be mandating it. So, so in other words, but, what, but it sounds like what you're saying is sort of the power of the commons, that you're going to have some people who don't wear them. You only need to have a certain amount and a mandate could get you there. Right. Even if you don't have enforcement, right? Right. So right, exactly. OK, so when, when you you mentioned uh, vaccine and I know you spent a lot of time on that and you also spent a lot of time on therapies, a considerable amount of time. Right. And the president did just uh, speak about that as well. Right. And his own experience recovering from the virus in the debate last night. Let me just play it again. I can tell you from personal experience that uh, I was in the hospital. I had it. And I got better, and I will tell you that uh, I had something that they gave me, a therapeutic, I guess they would call it. Some people could say it was a cure. Okay, cure is a really big word, and it's a word that all of us cling on to when we hear it. I know you've talked about that antibody cocktail that he received as possibly being extremely effective uh, in his case. Uh, Would you call that, though, a cure? 
You know, it's, it's semantics, Aaron. It, it really is. I mean, when you talk about a cure, you're talking about something that if you don't intervene, it's not going to get better by itself. Many of these cases spontaneously recover without any intervention. Mm -hmm. So when we intervene and a person gets better, I would rather say it hastened or improved greatly their recovery. Because cure means that, for example, you have cancer and you give someone chemotherapy, they're cured. If you didn't give them chemotherapy, they would have died. But when you have a situation where someone might ultimately get better anyway, the semantics of saying cure is just it means different things to different people. I would rather say these therapies are highly effective, if they are, I hope they will be, in essentially making someone improve much, much more rapidly than they normally would. And is that how you, is, is right now the antibody cocktail sort of the most promising thing that you are seeing out there? Or are there things in the wings that we're not even yet aware of? Well, you know, the antibody cocktail is, is, is really directed specifically against the virus itself. So that's something you would want to give more early in the course of infection. We have some good therapies that are for people who have advanced disease. What we really need to do much more of is get therapies to prevent people from getting into the hospital, as opposed to when they're in hospital and very ill to help them to get out of the hospital. So that's where we're focusing. Monoclonal antibodies, Aaron, are quite promising. The monoclonal antibody that the president received is quite promising. We're in the process right now of doing clinical trials for that antibody and antibodies from other companies to show that they are safe and effective. Yeah. Myself, I'm cautiously optimistic that they are going to be an important tool in our armamentarium of treatment. We were very successful with those type of antibodies with Ebola, and it made a big difference in Ebola. Yeah. I would hope and I think it might make a big difference here. One final question, Dr. Fauci. The president, again, last night called you a Democrat to disparage you. And it's not the first time, right? He's been saying it a lot lately, like here. I think he's a Democrat, but that's OK. Well, he's a Democrat. He's actually a very good friend of the Cuomo family. He's a Democrat. Everybody knows that. Um, you made it clear, obviously, you're, you're not registered to either party. And as I've said on the show, it's irrelevant wh no. what you are. It, it's, it's not relevant to what you do. But he keeps saying this um, to, to disparage you, to kind of bring your reputation down among people to whom that would seem to be a negative. Do you think he's trying to get you to quit? Uh, I don't think so, Aaron. I, I, don't, I don't pay attention to that kind of thing. And I have the, the, the ability that I had for a long time to just focus like a laser on what I need to do. And my job through vaccines, through therapies, and through by public health measures is to safeguard the health, the safety, and the welfare of the American public. That's all I concentrate on. These other kind of things, though people may find it difficult to believe, are, are, are mere distractions. They don't bother me. I know what my job is, and I've got to do it, and I'm going to do it. So. That kind of whatever you want to call it is to me, I just it's it's noise. Well, we all really appreciate this whole country appreciates uh, your laser focus on trying to do those things and protect the American people. And I thank you for your time tonight, Dr. Fauci. Good to be with you, Aaron. Thank you for having me.